How you doing? This is Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, saying, hey, what's up? I'm just doing a quick thing here, really quick thing here. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Welcome to the dark side of the room. How you guys doing? I'm Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer. And today we are going to talk about Aquaman. Now, know this, I haven't written a full review and all that jazz, but I just came out of the movie theater. So this is like my fresh scene out of the box type of thing and boy have I got some stuff to talk about um Aquaman 2016 or sorry 2018 or the last part of 2018 um should I say is um filmed by James Wan of course um and seriously this movie is what is the term a lot of people are like man I'm looking for hope I'm looking for this I'm looking for all that stuff um you know, we've got Jason Momoa as um, as Aquaman here, and that is some, well, how can I put it? This movie takes so much from so many comics. Um, came out in 2018, a lot of people are like, well, I don't know how I'm gonna feel about this. Of course, there's always, always, always a big thing of what are we looking at as um, very much the, um, we're doing Aquaman and Aquaman is, let's face it, he's the dude that talks to fish, right? Yeah, that's, that's what we know. He's a dude that talks to fish. And honestly, I have been in this guy's corner for years, years and years and years and years and years. Because one, I'm kind of hydrophobic. And the idea of somebody that commands water, like seriously says, hey, look, water is mine. We're doing we're, we're literally doing the water thing and the stuff that's in the water is what I command. I mean, seriously, this is, this is really terrifying to me, actually. So, um, but of course, you know, what do we got? We got dude grows up in a lighthouse. Um, then he grows up to be Jason Momoa as a drunken bro that likes to get into fights. And he goes around the ocean helping people, I suppose you could say. And then he falls into Game of Thrones as written by a high school, um, high school creative write writing student. So, um... Just to start this off, this movie is, in my opinion, the most fun movie that DC has put out. Okay, um, it really throws me back to Marvel Phase 1. And I hate doing the comparisons between Marvel and DC, but let's face it, Marvel has written the standard, and that's just what everybody's going to compare it to. So I'm just going to get it out of the way. Um, it really reminds me of a Phase 1 Marvel movie. It's an origin story, but it is a lot like Man of Steel where you don't get a chronologic narrative you get this is what's going on now now let's do some flashbacks now let's go back here now let's do some more flashbacks because Zack Snyder did it because the Watchmen called for it and anything related to DC Comics on film hasn't stopped <laughs> really hasn't stopped during the Watchmen it's been 10 years and um so that's that's what, you know, if you know to expect that, that's what you go in for and accept it, cool. And all in all, that's what this movie is expecting you to do. It expects you to accept a lot of things about DC movies um, that people like to fight against. People like to fight against them. Now, again, I'm going to say this. Um, I like the stories of DC more than I like the stories of Marvel because I like aspirational heroes more than I like cathartic heroes. Um, cathartic motivational heroes so I'm much more a fan of epic storytelling and I look at superheroes and I don't want to see myself I want to see I, I want some sort of inspiration to be better than I am Okay, so we're going to start that out and this movie we're going to cover three things we're going to cover the writing we're going to cover um, the effects and we are going to cover um, overall enjoyment okay um, and when I say the effects I mean like the technical stuff the technical effects um, so let's start there technical effects 
this movie is chock and full of CGI. And the truth is, I can't, I can't fault it for that. How are you going to film a movie that's 80% underwater? How, how do you do that? You know, um, Do you pull the Thor 1 route of go, this is Asgard. Now, let's go to New Mexico. Nah. Um, you go, hey, this is Asgard. This is otherworldly. And that's what they did. They're like, this is Atlantis. This is the ocean. And we're going to show you a lot of different aspects of the ocean. And there's no other way to do that outside of CGI or another form of anima animation. And should this movie have been animated? I would say no, because it needs a theatrical release. And superhero movies that are animated that get, <clears throat> that get theatrical releases, all in all, I can only think of one off the top of my head that was good. And I can't think of any that were taken seriously. But the two off the top of my head that I can think of were, of course, The Killing Joke um, that came out 2017 and Ask a DC Fan, we're disappointed. Um, and, of course, Batman and the Mask of the Phantasm. In my opinion, the quintessential Batman movie, even more so than The Dark Knight. Put Stop, stop, get away, get away from your keyboard. Dark Knight was a better movie. Mask of the Phantasm was a better Batman movie. But today we're talking about Aquaman because I'm sick of talking about Batman. And doing this movie as an animated feature <clears throat> honestly would have been good they kind of did it with the throne of atlantis um and all in all that was a good story it was a good look into aquaman of course not as good as the comic books because you don't have years and years and issues and issues this movie is two and a half hours and all in all um the visual effects were good i mean they were good for cgi you are going to have a bunch of CGI in it because the way that the director, James Wan, known for horror, um, the, the challenge that he had, okay, the technical challenge that he had was show people underwater as though underwater is their natural habitat. You can't do that without CGI. You can't do that practically, you know, because, you know, um, one of my favorite filmmakers, <clears throat> as far as technical stuff goes, James Cameron, he filmed The Abyss mostly underwater. True. But all the underwater scenes were about people in suits where they needed help breathing and operating underwater. This is important because most of the cast are Atlantean, so they're underwater. So how do you show that? How do you show people that don't need suits, um, that don't need, that really don't need any gear, to exist in a place where buoyancy compensates for gravity and you have you know hydrodynamics and all that stuff how do you show it that's a question they answered it to the best of their ability and when i say to the best of their ability i personally can't think of a better way they could have done it with the technology that we have now so honestly the effects all right cool the effects were cool um <clears throat> a lot of the costuming was interesting um the egalitarian part of me it's kind of screaming a little bit because the men wore armor and the women wore skin tight stuff so can we not sexify stuff up all the time i get that it has to be tight and i get that atlanteans would normally be and at least the human shaped ones would normally be in peak physical condition because they spend all their time swimming okay but a thousand years of evolution there should have been some chubby ones i'm sorry um, the other races that they did, I particularly liked the merfolk. I think they did those very well. Um, kind of a cross between the Abe Sapien from Hellboy from back in the nineties and fish people. Um, sadly, no soundtrack from death clock. So, you know, and they were philosophers instead of warriors. So the song wouldn't have actually worked. Um, but all in all, I think they did a good job distinguishing between the cultures of Atlantis um, and showing the technology and showing underwater existence. So that was kind of cool. Specifically, the color palette, I liked the very subtle way that they told the audience, like, this is what it looks like, but it's not what it would look like to us. This is what underwater looks like to an Atlantean because their eyes adjust for the darkness of the deep and most of the background happens in fishman vision so hey that's kind of cool um i i, I kind of like that they committed to that um 
And Black Manta was, how can I put it? They had that moment of showing why he has the big dumb helmet and they at least made it make sense. So I was happy with that. Now, um, let's get to the writing. The writing on this movie was, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, it could have been better is too easy to say because you can say that about just about any movie. I think the only perfectly written movie I've ever seen was Casablanca and it has a great big plot hole. Um, um, just to get out the way, spoiler for a movie that came out before there was color, those letters would never have been made. Okay, the, the, a, a letter of transit that has a blank name and that can't be questioned, bureaucracy don't work like that. But outside of that, the movie was perfectly written. So Aquaman could have been better written because it needed to pick what movie it wanted to be. Is it Game of Thrones? Is it Indiana Jones? Is it Camelot? Is it a horror film? Um, you know, what, what is it? Or is it a superhero origin story? I mean, we've got five movies that this thing could have been. And it didn't pick one. It really should have picked one. Um, the search for the MacGuffin story arc was very Indiana Jones and I don't particularly mind that because, well, how can I put it? Um, ever since Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's how you do it. And this movie had a lot of homages to Raiders of the Lost Ark and National Treasure and Tomb Raider and all of the solve ancient puzzles to find the MacGuffin. Um... So it had that aspect going for it. It also tried to be Game of Thrones slash Camelot. After all, the main character is, you know, King Arthur. So that's what we got on that. I'm trying to do as few spoilers as possible. Um, let's see. Um, the horror film aspect, again, I'm a hydrophobe, so, but Under the Water has a whole lot of scary stuff has always had a whole bunch of scary stuff, okay? I did a vlog on it a long time ago. I'll pull it up, I'll repost it, I'll do all that stuff. But yeah, seriously, that there are monsters in the water, okay? Monsters, sharks, whales, anglerfish, jellyfish, just whole bunch of stuff down there, and it's terrifying because it's dark and it's filled with things that would eat you offhand. Um, so this movie had... Um, in my opinion, the best shot scene in the movie was a very horror-driven sequence, which makes sense because James Wan is known as a horror director. So his roots really shined in this one, um, at least in that one scene. Now, let's see. So we've talked about uh, Game of Thrones with the political intrigue, power, intrigue, betrayal, plans within plans. And um, again... Any of these things could have been their own movie. And, of course, the superhero origin movie. Um, in truth, I was surprised at the casting. They had a whole bunch of Maoris cast in this, not just Jason Momoa. So I think that was a good idea for James Wan. Um, but the story of Arthur growing up in Maine and the story, the love story of his mom and dad, they were actually pretty intriguing. Now, I don't know if that's because I'm an adult or because it was well done. I'm still weighing that. Um, but Nicole Kidman actually didn't disappoint in this movie. Um, I was actually rather taken by her, not because of how she looked, but because I liked the character that she played. And um, But the story of Arthur growing up um, were most of the flashbacks. And if I were to re-edit this movie and put it in chronological order, that part of the movie would have been too short in the sense of, no, it didn't get a lot of screen time, but I wanted it to. It was really interesting. Um, now, to let you guys know, much like the DC movies of, you know, um, not the past, but the DC movies that we've had over the past 10 years, Man of Steel, Wonder Woman, BBS, and now Aquaman, and yeah, no, not Count Suicide Squad, um, it doesn't show that Aquaman is a hero. It shows how he becomes a king and a hero. So they have to have those scenes of him not exactly being the coolest guy in the beginning. I know, I know what you're thinking, you know, Aquaman being shown not to be the coolest guy? Well, duh. But, um, 
but that was a really big uh, that was a really big aspect um the first action scene was pretty awesome in the sense of you know from a writer's point of view it shows this is a threat this is the character this is what he's capable of um the submarine fight scene was well choreographed but again that's a standard that we've come to expect because of the cw and the netflix um, marvel series so all of these things are just common thread these are things that if they're good they don't need mentioning what does need to be mentioned is aquaman or jason momoa's aquaman james wan aquaman does not start as a good guy He's trying to do the right thing, but he doesn't do it the right way. And he's very much the, I don't care about killing the bad guy hero. So that was interesting. What I appreciate about it wasn't that it was being grimdark for the sake of being grimdark, say like Arrow season one. Um, But it was, he had a chance to save someone and he willfully and knowingly didn't he willfully and knowingly let a dude die and that created one of his arch nemeses and i'm going okay i actually like that a lot better than i liked it in the comic books because in the comic books it was a mistake an accident and he spends a lot of time trying to say i'm sorry can we work this out but in this one it was this dude was a jerk now swear a blood oath now let's it was very hamilcar barca and hannibal so i was good with that um what else about this writing again the way that the movie was written i could see the sparks of at least three good movies um like this movie tried to cram a trilogy into two and a half hours and it made me hate people it really did it made me truly truly dislike people primarily because how can i put it um they are so um what's the word what's the word it had the inkling of a really good movie there but you can tell that the executives or you know the money had a fear that people wouldn't take aquaman seriously there was very much that i could see the fear i could see the trepidation in the money and the money was like, well, you got to show him being badass. And you got to show him being this. And we need a love story. And and we need some adventure. So let's give him some Indiana Jones. And we need this. And we need that. And we need this. And instead of letting it flow naturally and happen over the course of the film, you could really see studio interference with the amount of exposition that was put in there. The switching from one type of movie to another type of movie to another type of movie back to another type of movie you could see that the screenplay either needed another rewrite or two or there were memorandums set down from upstairs to say okay this is what we want you guys doing today and it was jarring it was really jarring because each of the movies could have been good each of the movies and when i say good i mean amazing at least as good as the sam raimi spider-man trilogy um now with all that being said i am gonna say this i had a problem with a lot of the actors performances because the dialogue as it was written and said was very unnatural except for jason momoa ironically um because I don't really see his stage presence. I'm not saying I'm not a fan. I like him, but I don't really like him as an actor, if you understand what I mean. Um, He seems like somebody that you could have a beer with, and as long as he's playing the roles of the dude that would have a beer with you. Matter of fact, there was an entire scene that's set up to show what it's like to have a beer with Jason Momoa. It was so interesting. Um, So, yeah, when he's out there being the dude you can have a beer with awesome you can watch him all day um but when he's outside of that comfort zone it's not very compelling i would say and i can't believe i'm saying this but henry cavill actually has a little bit more screen presence than jason momoa and sorry i know mission impossible titans the superman stuff um J- um he had a little more stage presence just as the Superman character that as than Jason Momoa has as Aquaman. 
Um, but the other actors, okay, except for the veterans. Now, this movie has three, three, count them, one, two, three, three veteran actors in um, Nicole Kidman, Dolph Lundgren, and Willem Dafoe. And you can really see it. You can really see that years of experience reflected in the characters that they're playing. Um, the actors that are under 45, however, um, their lines came off very, very stilted. And when I say stilted, I don't mean like they didn't know what they were saying, but it seemed like the reins were really tight on whether or not they can improvise. Um, so they spoke in a way that didn't have very many contractions or very many idioms, which means Atlantis in an interesting way didn't really seem like it was its own society okay i mean it had a few things like they would talk about the trench but then they would have to explain what the trench was there was no natural flowing stuff um if you check out the current season of the flash um one of the characters is from 30 years in the future and she she uses colloquialisms she uses idioms and you start to understand it the more you watch the show. But this movie didn't have time for that, so it was, these are the trench, these are the monsters that went to this place, and blah, 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 blah. And um, what I could see was, watching this as an American, I could feel the stiltedness. However, and this is an important thing, this movie will easily be dubbed into other languages. It was written in the same way that military children who grow up from base to base to base to base actually speak so not very many idioms everything is clearly said so that anyone can understand it regardless of where you're from and it doesn't seem like that big of a thing when you're sitting down to write a story but it comes out it comes out and you could see it on screen when it's not done well in the case of this um and again, one or two rewrites, this would have been so much better. So much better, it would have flowed more naturally. Um, now, this took elements from the Peter David run of Aquaman back in the 90s, where they really expanded, like the Peter David run of Aquaman before his hand was chopped off or after his hand was chopped off in the books, but it expanded on the seven different kingdoms of Atlantis and... The Throne of Atlantis story arc um, from DC Rebirth, or was it New 52? It was, I, I believe it was um, New 52. And it would make sense because that's when this thing went into production was before DC Rebirth. And, um, and it took elements from Indiana Jones and a few elements from some horror movies and a few elements. It took elements from a whole lot of places, but it didn't feel completely like itself. Now, all that being said, it was fun. It was really fun. Um, it was much brighter. The color palette was brighter. But the writing in and of itself was very much focused around and then. Aquaman does this and then. Mira does this and then. So um, some. I'm trying not to give any spoilers because if I do, you won't have to see the movie at all. Okay, It's really one of those things that's easily spoiled. But you can imagine the movie... Um, if you don't care about the plot points, just imagine a 10-year-old telling you a story that they haven't really written because they don't know how to write stories yet. They're 10. So it's very, oh, and Aquaman is in the aquarium, and then he is going and getting a submarine, and then he beats a guy up, and then he talks to a shark, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then. Um, but the spectacle... It's very brightly colored. People there are having fun, which is weird for a DC movie. And it comes to a really big climax. Now, I was leaving the movie, and I've been talking about Aquaman for a long time. Like I said, I've been an advocate of Aquaman is cool. Stop making fun of the dude. And one of the things that I was always on was how dangerous the ocean is in regards to our modern society. So, you know, I'm like, dude, he commands the entire ocean. So if he wants our shipping around the world, gone. And they show they show that. Um, they show how our defenses 
are really dependent upon the permission of the ocean because part of that part of what happens in the movie is that the ocean takes the permission away and of course since we don't know that much about the ocean full of monsters in the sense of a tiger was a monster when we didn't know what it was and then we named it tiger magic you teach people what a tiger is and then they go oh it's a tiger it's a great big cat you, you teach people what an elephant is and it's oh it's an elephant they're adorable but if you've never seen one before and it's charging right at you monster and um they show this they show this with a lot of sea creatures and <clears throat> since this is a movie and it has a fantasy element about it they give us monsters like monsters um there was that was the fifth movie, Kaiju. It, it has a Kaiju and it is awesome. Um, yes, it's very reminiscent of Pacific Rim, but you got one hand people saying, well, the monster didn't look realistic, so you can hire a biologist and they can show you what a monster would look like under the circumstances of this. And then you make it and you got Pacific Rim. But that also means that each monster kind of looks like a Pacific Rim monster. Even the new Godzilla, they look like Godzilla and they look like Mothra and Rodan, but they have that same hint of, according to what we know about science, this is what they would look like today. So I'm gonna back off on that because yeah, this looks like a giant freaking monster from the deep, just like all the other giant freaking monsters from the deep of the past 15 years. It's just the style of art we're in for movies. So was it enjoyable? Yes. Did I have fun? Yes. Um, however, I saw a one o'clock showing of it on Friday, the day of opening, because I didn't want to deal with a theater full of kids going, Aquaman! And there was already one that was in the theater, because we're so close to Christmas, going, Aquaman! And I'm like, okay, cool. Not that I don't love chids, I really do. Um, I just didn't, I, I don't have it in me to deal with 50 of them that I can't talk to. Um, tonight I just don't I, I don't have the strength for it so I saw it in the afternoon and I'm glad I did so all in all I would give this movie a two pair like you're holding on and all you need is one more and then you got a full house but what are the chances of you getting that one more that's that question so um yeah I definitely give it um a two pair um am I gonna go see it again in the theater no am I going to own it on video or on dvd Yes, because I collect everything superhero movie related. And yes, that also means I have a copy of Superman Returns and I have a copy of Captain America from 1990 starring, um, starring, I almost said Brett Favre. No, Red Brown. Um, Brett Favre have not done it, but any movie that he's in needs to have John Madden to tell everybody to give the bar to Brett Favre. But, um, so I'm going to own it because I'm that kind of guy. If you want just a good time, just you want a turn your brain off look at the spectacle movie that's exactly what this gave you um it's very reminiscent of the first two thor movies um but honestly aquaman could have been a little more like chris hemsworth um jason momoa could have been a little more like chris hemsworth um and his his emotional arc was really sudden but again I don't know if this was written for an American audience as much as it was written for an overseas audience. So, um, so that's where I'm sitting as an American who studies monarchy and nobility and stuff like that. And there's a lot of things in that that aren't going to fly well because we're, um, we're showing a movie with a bunch of nobility, but, uh, let's face it. We're Americans. Nobility isn't really something that we're familiar with because our identity as a nation is no kings, like none. We don't deal with kings, we don't deal with kings well. And why is this important? Because it comes out in the performances of the actors under 45. Um, I forgot the name of the actor offhand and I didn't make notes because I'm trying to give this to you as fresh as possible. But the actor who played Orm, the Ocean Master, you might know him as Night Owl from The Watchmen. Um, amazing acting skill in the sense of you wouldn't recognize him. He dropped like 100 pounds. He got all chiseled. Um, his hair is blonde, so he kind of looks like uh, the millennial the millennial edition of Julian Sands. But yeah, it's good old Night Owl. And um, he doesn't know how to give... Um, 
he doesn't know how to give a regal performance because he's an American actor. Where would he learn regal? Like, where there is there hasn't been time and experience enough in our culture for people to internalize that kind of thing. So that's where that comes from. But all in all, um, but you get Nicole Kidman, you get Willem Dafoe, actors that have been around the world, that have been to places that have nobility, that have probably met some royalty over the course of their time, and they have a pool to draw from. And that was, that was there. Um, one of the gripes that I have, and this is just a little bit of nitpick, was um, Amber Heard in the Justice League had naturally rare, red hair. And Amber Heard in Aquaman, you guys saw it on the commercials. So there you go. Um, but they did a lot of subtle things that I liked, like um, the Atlanteans pay in Spanish doubloons, which is kind of cool because they're down there. And if you know how to move them, they're way more valuable than freaking um, um, briefcases full of cash. So that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, with all that, I'm going to say... It was enjoyable, definitely a two pair, um, meaning you're probably not gonna win the hand, but you have a feeling that you might, you're kind of hoping for more, um, and you stick down to the river. So yeah, yeah, two pair. And um, again, your kids are gonna love it. <laughs> um, if you've been a comic book fan um, for as long as I have, you're gonna like it. But if you're expecting something as good as Winter Soldier or um, Dark Knight, don't, don't, okay? So with that, I'm going to say thank you guys very much. Um, and remember, if anybody tells you guys that you can't keep the company you keep because of the circumstances of your birth, be it race, religion, creed, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, your budget, or your disability, you tell them that we said to put those cards back in the deck. This is Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, and I'm saying thank you. Um, for meeting me on the dark side of the room, and I will catch you guys next time. Mm -hmm.